Okay, so as it quite rightly says up there, I am a boxer and I'm definitely a dreamer. But it, what it doesn't say is that uh, I'm also a musician. So, seeing as the theme that I've been given to talk about today is performance anxiety, I thought it was only fair and right that I began with my own performance. Thank you. <laughs> that was the right reaction, by the way, because obviously I can't play the guitar. Um, and I think by most people's standards, uh, that, that was uh, a little bit of a, sorry, a little bit of a fail. Um, now, it's a bit odd that I could stand on a TED stage at the Royal Northern College of Music, no less, and be rubbish at playing a musical instrument. And yet, I wasn't nervous before it. And the fact that you're all sat here thinking I'm rubbish at playing the guitar doesn't bother me in the slightest, not one bit. How can that be? Well, that's because, and it brings me to the first point, really, about performance anxiety, that we get nervous and anxious about performance when it really, really matters to us, when it has deep meaning to us. So if you all leave here today thinking I'm rubbish at playing the guitar, that's okay. However, if you were to come and watch me boxing, doing the thing that I dedicate my life to being as good as I can possibly be at, and you left there thinking I was rubbish at that, it would really, really bother me. There are loads and loads of risks involved with performance, whether it's performing as a sports person, a musician, in business, or in all the other areas of life that we perform. Risks of the heartbreak of injury, like most athletes have been through, losing, being badly beaten. But it's worth it because the rewards can be immense. And I think it's a, a, a real tragedy at times that people are put off from even trying things in the first place because of the risks that are involved. This is my niece, Ruby. Um, now, they say that we're born fearless, and there's that saying, isn't there, that what would you do if you didn't have any fear? Well, if you didn't have any fear at all, you'd probably be dead because you wouldn't feel a thing, because it's natural for human beings to feel fear. We should ask what we can do anyway, despite feeling fear. My little niece did feel fear on the edge of that diving board, but I think she'd been stood there that long, curious and wondering what was going to happen, that she went for it anyway. Now, we're all old enough to know what happened next. <laughs> a brutal belly flop. <laughs> Chlorine, snot, tears, water everywhere. But I think this picture beautifully captures the moment where she was in fearless moment of performance, uh, which we all strive for. The irony of um, preparing for this talk was that I was preparing for the most nerve-wracking performance of my life, which was my professional debut. Every time I went to put pen to paper, I was kind of looking something like this <laughs> because like the nerves were actually happening at the time. Was, I was feeling sick, I, my legs were like jelly. But it helped me because it was more vivid. I wasn't having to reflect on what my last set of nerves was like. I was, I was living it there and then. And whilst I was going through those very uncomfortable feelings of nerves and anxiety, I reminded myself of this photo. This is me in the gym, that's my dad sparring. Um, and I loved everything about my sport. I absolutely loved it. I did everything that all the boys did, but I wasn't allowed to box because at the time it was banned for females. So this is what I had to do a lot of the time, was stand back and watch, and I'd have given anything for the chance to box. So when I was being nervous and whining and complaining about these horrible nerves, I reminded myself of that, that at one time I'd have given anything for that opportunity, and I wasn't about to let fear stop me. I needed to grab it with both hands. It's natural when we jump out of our comfort zone to feel fear. It's, it's normal. It doesn't mean it's a sign of weakness or we're destined to fail. It just means we're human and it's a normal function. I'd like to share with you three examples of when I've pushed myself out of my comfort zone. That are very different examples, but had the same fear involved. This was um, in 2010, and I went to America to play football on what's called a sports scholarship. And you go and play football for the university. I had £200 in my pocket. Um, Obviously, I'd never gone that far away from home before. I had no idea what to expect. I didn't know anybody. I was absolutely scared to death at the airport in my two cases, not knowing what was going to happen. But I'm so glad I took that risk because it was worth the reward of having one of the best experiences of my life. A totally different experience was last year when me and my boyfriend went to the refugee camps at Calais and Dunkirk to do sporting activities with the children there. And it, the day we set off was the day that they were closing the camp and the amount of scaremongering in the media, I can't begin to tell you, the abuse that we got on Twitter was unbelievable. And we did have fears, of course we did, but we took the risk anyway and I'm so glad we did because the immense reward that we got was to connect with some of the most incredible children you could ever meet during that week. 
And finally, the most recent one was obviously making my professional debut and that put me way out of my comfort zone in a sporting context. Now, I'm not an expert. I'm not here as a psychologist or a sports psychologist or anything. So all I want to do is share my personal experiences of nerves and anxiety. And as a boxer, I can assure you, we have a very, very intimate relationship with nerves. And I can pretty much put them into three mountains, if you like, that I feel I have to overcome in order to, order to perform at my best. Imposter syndrome, demons and monsters, and everybody on the planet. Slight exaggeration. I had no idea what the imposter syndrome was. As a 17-year-old stood waiting to make my England debut, I was stood there with my teammates with the three lines on my chest listening to the anthem. I'd dreamed about it many, many times and I'd imagined it had been the most incredible feeling. And in fact, it wasn't because I was bombarded with these imposter voices telling me, what are you doing here? You don't deserve to be here. You're not as good as all of these people. You're not good enough to be here. I didn't know where it was coming from. There were things I'd never dream of saying to somebody else, yet here I was, my own mind, attacking me. This imposter problem was something that was to plague me for years and years and years. Every single achievement I had in sport came along and was kind of stained really by these imposter voices. Nowadays, I like to characterise them. I don't know if everyone will remember these two. Sissy and Ada, it was Les Dawson and Roy Barraclough who used to play these funny characters and they'd gossip and be like, ooh, Ada, ooh. And, and that's how I kind of imagine them now. And I'll, I'll kind of talk back to them and say, Sissy, Ada, it's OK. Of course I deserve this. I've worked hard for it. Shh pipe down and I talk back to them. There's a really nice way that the author, Elizabeth Gilbert, puts it for the imposter syndrome and she says, it's okay to give the imposters a seat in your car as a passenger, but you mustn't let them drive. And that's true. You have to learn to live with them, but for years I let them drive. And the turning point for me was the European Championships in 2014. This is me on media day with the rest of the GB team. This is where you do interviews and everybody's coming from the media and stuff like that. At one time, this would have been my undoing. And I'd have been sat there thinking, why have you even got that tracksuit on? What are you thinking? There's Olympians you sat with here. What are you doing? Get out of the picture. But I didn't, because before that tournament, I decided no more. I was going to learn how to live with these imposter voices that had plagued me. And throughout the tournament, with the help of the GB sports psychologist and, and the amazing team that they've got, I was well prepared for every single fight. And I did battle with the imposters, but I got through it and eventually I got to the final. I can honestly tell you that when I was on the podium with the silver medal around my neck, watching my country's flag be raised, I enjoyed every single second. And I'd never been able to say that before. There was no voices filling my head. There was just an immense amount of pride filling my heart and it was an amazing feeling, so it can be done. Next is the demons and monsters. These are these little gremlin things, these little seeds of doubt that start in your mind and they get bigger and bigger and bigger until eventually they, they look something like this. This happened to me at a tournament in Serbia. And when you get to a tournament as a boxer, you're all sizing each other up. Is she my weight? Is she my weight? I bet she is. And they could be even bigger than you or smaller than you, you don't really know, but you're constantly kind of trying to size them up and, and see. So. The morning of the draw, I drew a Serbian and shortly after at the hotel, I saw this woman in a Serbian top and I thought, she's my way, it's her. And I was like sizing her up and thinking, right, I'm ready. By the end of the day, she got bigger and stronger and fitter and faster and tougher. And in the end, I might as well have been boxing this guy. That's how extreme it had got in my mind. So the next day after that, we go to the weigh-in, get back to the hotel and I see this lady and she didn't have that t-shirt on, she had a uniform on. She was a dinner lady. <laughs> she didn't look like that, by the way. But she was a bit meaner looking than that. But it just shows you that it can be a bit ridiculous how your mind blows things out of proportion and how it can fill you with fears that don't actually even exist. So I would recommend not to fight with these demons and monsters because we rarely win. What I find useful, though, is to imagine parking them. So sometimes before a fight, I'll say, look, demons and monsters, I know that you're trying to warn me of danger and that's your job but I'm good. I've trained for this, I'm prepared, I'm ready. So I'm just going to park you right there and I'll see you after the fight because you cannot come into the ring with me. And sometimes I embrace them because although they feel very, very uncomfortable, the sickness, the jelly in your legs, the butterflies in your tummy, that's what makes you sharp and reactive and perform at your very best. So sometimes it's worthwhile to embrace them. The final one is everybody else on the planet and wow, do we worry about this all of the time. So it might be during a performance, so you might be 
performing obviously a musical piece or you might be a sporting performer, you might be giving a talk like this and you might be thinking, are people giving me eye contact? Are they laughing at the right time? Did they like me? Are they enjoying the talk? Are people asleep? All of these things that we, we just can't possibly control. Then we'll worry afterwards if people are writing reviews or the commentators and pundits talking about what you've done. And we worry, worry, worry about what everyone thinks. And of course, these days we have this element to worry about, people on Twitter. Um, I've been subjected to quite a bit of this, from the really, really silly things to some quite cruel and horrible things. Um, I want to share one with you, um, where it was a, a gentleman who shared his opinion with me that I shouldn't be boxing. And it's strange being in a sport where people feel able all of the time to question whether you should be there or not, based simply on your gender. And so I said, yeah, I'll just enjoy boxing, I just happen to be a woman, you know. And he said, what do you do when you're not being offended? And I said, I'm winning medals for my country, how about you? <laughs> but he, he didn't reply to that one, so. When I read these things, it gets me down, as I'm sure it does for all of you. And you, you're trying to do your best and you're trying to do positive things in the world. And there's people saying negative stuff and it does get you down. But then I ask myself whose opinion counts. Now, I know that not all Twitter trolls will look like this, but this is how I imagine them. A creepy kind of person in a dark room <laughs> with a pizza and an energy drink, like typing nasty things. And I have to ask myself, is this whose opinion counts? Well, no, not really. And this brings me to the last bit, which is, for me, the most important part of performance anxiety, the why, why we're doing stuff. So I want to share with you my why. I want to win. <laughs> it's the best feeling ever when you've challenged yourself, pushed yourself. This is me just after my pro debut. I mean, I'd only won one, but you know, <laughs> it was a long road to get there, so I don't my moment. Um, and it's a euphoric feeling when the referee raises your hand. It's what all boxers live for. Um, so I want to win. That's one of my whys. I want to change things in my sport. I came from starting out as a little girl who couldn't compete in my sport because it was banned for women to having now represented my country and made a professional debut. I want to keep being the driving force in my sport. I was waiting for years for other people to step up and be pioneers. Now I know that I've got to do it. There's little people I love looking up to me. My little nieces, Ruby and Eliza, and my little sister Poppy, and I want to be a positive role model for them. I want to make my family proud, even the crazy ones who come to the airport to pick me up from the World Championships dressed as boxers. <laughs> even those ones, the people who support me day in, day out, I want to make them proud. I want to empower girls. I get lots of messages from parents telling me their girls are told that they can't do something or they think they can't do something. I want to be the example for them that they can. I want to inspire people and have a positive impact. And if I can do that, it still is the greatest privilege for me as an athlete and a human being. The project I've just set up, Pave the Way, does exactly that. It's about encouraging girls and women to reach their potential through sport. Hopefully, eventually, posters like this will be the norm where there's a female fighter featured on them. And lastly, I want to go back and tell her, little me, that I know she's struggling at the minute with that name calling, boy, tomboy, shim, she-male, just because she's doing sports that are boys' sports. I don't want to tell her, I know you're being told that there's no girls' teams for you. You're not allowed to play in the boys' team. You're not allowed to box. And later you'll discover there's no Olympic weight category for you. There's no Commonwealth game category for you, European game category for you, and you can't be a professional boxer either. But I want to tell her, Keep taking those risks. Keep going. Because the reward will be worth it. And in the end, we will make it. And we did. And this is me coming out for the very first time as a professional boxer with two students from my school, because I didn't want ring card girls. And it was an amazing feeling. Throughout that week, this quote really helped me by the great Muhammad Ali. If your dreams don't scare you, they're not big enough. Well, believe me, I was scared that week. Scared to death. I'd never felt pressure like it. I'd never felt nerves like it. But that's what told me I was doing what I needed to be doing. I was dreaming big enough and I was doing something that mattered. And not just something that mattered to me, but that mattered to my entire sport. So I'd ask you when you leave today, think about what's your why. What is it? Because don't, don't allow fears to stop you from sharing your gifts, what makes you unique with the world. And don't stop it. Don't let it stop you from trying at all, because that's the worst thing ever. Just try and bear in mind that if you can overcome those fears, the rewards are worth it. And honestly, if you believe in your purpose enough and you're passionate about it and you feel strong enough about it and it's deep in your heart, it will be a strong enough force to overcome any fear that you could ever face. So please, leave thinking about what's your why and go on despite your fears and share your gifts 
with the world and inspire everybody else. Thank you very much.